Guru Hey, this is the Forward Motion Business Show. I'm Professor Ken. And I'm Professor Paul Marino. And uh, I'm very honored tonight to have a gentleman I consider a friend, uh, someone who has been a beacon in our community. Uh, I've read your book, David, several times, and I'm always touched by the title, you know, A Dedicated Life. And you certainly have achieved that. Uh, you've been an editor of some of the major newspapers throughout the United States. But even with that tremendous responsibility, you have found time to give back. So, someone coming out of school who may want to pursue a journalist career, a business career, what advice would you give them today? Better darn well find something you really love. Don't think that money is the most important thing. Until my wife got Alzheimer's, she handled every nickel we had for more than 50 years. We raised five children, and they're now 58 to 38. They're really good human beings, which pleases me deeply. I ran a big business. The Miami Herald had $300 million in revenue a year with an 18% operating margin. That's a, that's a healthy profitable business. I decided, as you know, at age 57, to do a completely different chapter after 35 years at seven newspapers. And this also I consider a business imperative. How do you get kids started off in this world so they ultimately end up succeeding? Understanding that 85% of brain growth occurs by the age of three, understanding that if you have 100 children at the end of the first grade who are lousy readers, at the end of the fourth grade, 88 of the 100 are still lousy readers, so you better get the first year's focus. But uh, what I wanted is for folks to love what they do, like to come to work, understand how to build relationships with other human beings, work harder than anybody else. So I grew up on a farm, I'm one of nine children, second oldest of nine children, chicken farm, which is not a very glamorous form of farming. Um, and I was driving a tractor by the age of 10. Nobody would be permitted to do this anymore. Uh, but uh, my strength is that I've been willing to work harder than other folks, and I'm not saving my energy for the next world. You know that we had a conversation, uh, Professor Ken and I, about Generation Z, and um, they don't seem to exhibit a lot of patience. Um, what would you say to them? Well, I don't want anybody to have a five-year plan or a ten-year plan. Um, I want life to be somewhat more serendipitous than that. I want people to be open for the opportunities. I also have read a good deal and thought a good deal about Generation Z and so forth. I'm not sure totally what I think, but I've always been a driven idiot, and I'm not sure that uh, folks ought to have quite the drive I have. On the other hand, um, it's enabled me to focus, focus, focus. Uh, it's enabled me to raise millions of dollars for things that I care about mm -hmm. um, would make a difference in, the, in this world. I frequently quote a so more or less the inventor of the American public school system 150 plus years ago was a man named Horace Mann, who at one point speaks to the graduating class of Antioch in 1859. The Civil War is just around the corner. And he says, be ashamed to die before you have won some battle for humanity. I'm more conscious at age 81 how short life is. And, and I'm going to use what I have in the time that, that I have. So um, I'm not retiring. Um, I, I don't expect you to. No, I you. know I love what I do. and, and I. And I like being with people, and I like making a difference. And uh, I don't play golf. I don't play tennis. I don't belong to country clubs. 
if my five children and my seven grandchildren are all right, I can put up with the rest of the world. I've been married almost 60 years. Uh, I feel very blessed. And for any pain that I have, you don't have to go very far to find out somebody's got it tougher than you do. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I know you're a voracious reader, and I, I have a funny story to tell. Uh, whenever I go to visit David, the first words what out of reading? his mouth is, what are you reading? What are you reading? A dedicated life. Oh, okay. Well, that, I can see the intelligence <laughs> in your face. So, David, I have a question. So, um, we, like my Professor Paul um, said earlier, when we, when we talk about um, guests and when we bring on guests on, we try to focus on Gen, Gen Zs and let's call millennials. Oh, Mom, your, your children are 38 to 58. Mine are actually uh, 20 to 30, right? Mm -hmm. 32, actually. So uh, a generation gap there. And we, we find that there's a lot of opportunity out there for someone who is in college now who's, let's say, starting up. You mentioned you wouldn't be allowed to, uh, to, to, ride, to learn how to ride a tractor at 10, which is probably true. But now with all this technology that we've had, and I think we're blessed to live in this, in this world where we have all this information at our fingertips now, and now you know about the chat GPT and all the AI. I, I did chat that. GPT a couple of weeks ago <laughs> with somebody who worked. It is amazing. It is, it is. And as Henry Kissinger would tell you at age 99, it's also very scary. It could be. Um, so how this works its way out, who knows? And we're only seeing the beginning of it right we're only. Well, I saw Ray Kurzweil speak one time, and he said that, well, you know, the, with the exponential growth, and he said, well, only at the very, very, uh, yeah, zero, 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 yeah. two of that exponential growth. So my, my question would be then, so you build these, you have to build a skill set. You have to build a skill set. You have to pick up those, the fundamentals. I'm a baseball guy. You have to know how to throw, catch, and still base or hit a ball. Right? I'm a baseball guy too. And so with, with that being said, with all this technology, it's easier to, let's call it, not learn the fundamentals because you've got all this information at your fingertips. What would you suggest then if you're Gen Z? Do you really have to put put the work in, start off at the bottom level and, and put your time in to grow the corporate ladder? Or So I, I have mentored for the last eight years a young man whose father was in prison to, until recently for opioid dealing. I visited the father in prison. You know what the program is mm -hmm. because you've been involved in helping those folks. He's a wonderful young man, tall, good-looking, been shot on two different occasions, wow. a total of three bullets. And, you know, life is still in the balance for him as to what, how he might turn out. And it, he's very good at sports, and he cares deeply about sports. But I said, pretend you're at a White House state dinner. I've been to a couple of those. You're seated in round tables. Your spouse is at another table. And you're seated there between a famous United States senator and a famous author. What the hell are you going to talk about? Because they've never heard of LeBron James or Dwayne Wade. And so that's not going to be an avenue for you. What are you going to talk about? And... You know, I've never wanted any of my five children to be too good looking, uh, too good with people, too charismatic, uh, and to some degree too smart. Because then people will try to get by on that great gift that God gave them. And so I've seen it time and time again. Somebody who's stunningly good with other human beings very, very popular. All of us go to school and they're the popular kids in school. Um, and I don't think you can do what you want to do in this world and simply on the basis of being popular. And most of us, almost all of us, are not Einstein. Uh, and most of us... Um, are, are not people who are instinctively going to be loved and admired. You need to work at it. And I want people who understand that you better be doing something that you really love 
that you think would make a difference not only in your life but in other people's lives. I want you to be able to work harder than the than the people seated seated at either side of you. Right. I want you to read regularly. I read basically two books a week, mostly history and biographies. I do a history book group in my home for about 25 people who will be there Sunday, as a matter of fact. I want them to understand the lessons of history. I want them to understand, for instance, that Hitler came to power legally. It wasn't the stormtroopers who brought him in. Right. And the business community said, well, we can control this guy. He's better than the communists. And then later on, 60 million people are dead in, in the world. Uh, I've been in 56 countries, including places like Bangladesh and Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, when I go to another country, I'll read several books about politics, geography, the great literature. I want to be able to ask good questions. And, the, you know, this university is important and people are going to learn great skills. But I also want people to be lifelong learners. Yeah. Um, and if they succeed, they're going to succeed in, fundamentally on a willingness to be energetically purposeful, and they're going to succeed on the basis they know how to build relationships with other human beings. And they're going to um, understand that you got to have the big picture and the vision, but you darn sure need to spell somebody's name right, because yes. if you can't spell somebody's name right, this is my journalism training, if you can't spell somebody's name right, then do I really care about you at all? Yeah, you know, we have uh, Microsoft uh, spell check and uh, Grammarly now that help us out with everything we write, so it's pretty... But, but you've go, also got to have all of those things are just fine and useful, but you've also got to have the self-discipline yeah. to think that the detail is important. I, I spoke a couple of, or really about a year ago for some big community of, and event in Miami and talked about sort of the 12 lessons of, of my own life. They're all fundamental. One of the fundamental lessons is something I've followed all my life. If somebody sends me an email or text or whatever, I literally could be in Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I would get back to you that same day. It might be to say, it'll take me a couple of days to get a full enough answer for you, but I'll get back to you that day. Um, that's what I want for myself, therefore I want it for other people. That's, a, that's amazing discipline. I don't know if there's many people that can say that. Well, I know as far as emails go, you're generally back to me in five minutes. <laughs> okay, well, well, don't send me something tonight to test me. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, yeah, no, I'm, and, you know, one of the advantages is if I go ahead and respond to you, then I don't need to think about it anymore. Yes. Uh, it's past me, and I mostly work out of my home now, though I still have an office, and... And I literally have a bring-up system that says, I need to do this, then, this, right. then, Updates. this, then, this, then, then, and so forth. Yeah, you follow that, um, that two-minute rule. Uh, you get it, if you get it done in two minutes, then go ahead and do it. The problem is that we have 100 emails come in in five minutes, and you're buying... Yeah, I probably answer 125 emails a day myself, yes, but, but, but I don't do big, chunky emails. Uh, I try to be gracious and thoughtful and warm, but if I need to write an email longer than a screenful, I'm not doing things right. Yeah, good point. You know, David, you talked about, uh, you just touched on a subject that I know is near and dear to my heart and yours as well. You talked about you have to have a purpose, and um, I feel that everyone needs to give back and your list of giving back is probably the longest i know you've you've one of the founders of the children's trust you're one of the founders of haiti tech uh you early child development is high on your priorities so i feel that someone who achieves a certain level of success 
could be a young person, could be an older person, has a responsibility to give back. Totally. What's your thoughts? Well, I, I, I certainly and totally and fully agree with you. Uh, the joy of life is making a difference in other people's lives. Anne Frank said it much better than I'm going to say it, but Anne Frank, in the middle of the Holocaust, in which she was to die, she was holed up in a garret in Amsterdam for a couple of years, and, and somebody, quote, ratted on her, and she ended up dying in Bergen-Belsen in March of 1945. But in the middle of the Holocaust, in 43 or 44, in her diary, she said words to the, isn't it wonderful that you don't have to wait single, one single moment to do something good for somebody else? Now, if she can say that, I suspect we ought to be, be able to see it. I grew up in this large Irish Roman Catholic home. I was baptized at St. Patrick's in, in New York City grew up on a farm, all 11 of us would sit around a table. My father would quiz us on government and politics. We didn't have much money at all, yet all nine children ended up graduating from a state university after we moved to Florida because the farm didn't do so well. But we were told that each of us is special and it each of us has an obligation to make some difference in other people's lives. And all the great values in the world are simple. And the same great values that would hold true in Japan or Poland or France and the United States are all very basic values. And if you can keep those straight in your head, um, you don't need to do a lot of backing and filling and let me tell you this and why this and so forth. I think life is pretty straightforward, or needs to be pretty straightforward. And you need to live a life in which it has some meaning to you and to other human beings. Um, so a young person, they're in college, they're focused on their career. When? When do you say to them, you know, you've got that, that job at the Miami Herald. It's, it's a great, great job. job. But it's not enough. What do you say to that young person? To get them on the path to realize that life is more than the rise and fall of commerce. Well, I think we're all proving ourselves through life. I also think that being a bit insecure is not a bad thing. I've always been some insecure but I've had the chutzpah to go ahead and go and do something. Now, what I think is tragic is that a five or six year old already saying, I can't do this work. All the other kids seem to be doing it, I can't do this work. So because we have to live with ourselves, then you act up and out, and then teachers, special track folks. And then a further challenge frequently is something that George W. Bush talked about some years ago, which is the soft bigotry of low expectations. I've always had very high expectations for my own children, for the people I work with. I expect people to tell the truth. I expect people to try to be fair, etc. Uh, I've been able to lead a life where there's not a lot of backing and filling. Mm -hmm. And, and since money has not been a central driver, we live in a community here which is stunning the money in this community. Some of it way over the top. I'm in somebody's um, apartment in Surfside the other night and on the 10th floor, lovely person and lovely apartment overlooking the ocean. And just for kicks, I looked up afterwards, what was this apartment cost? Well, it, $19 million. Uh, so as a person who grew up on a farm that was sold when I was 14 for, for $6,000, um, and then eight children at that point came down to Florida, you know, I, what other people think is so important about what kind of car you have and what kind of house, it just has been less important to me. Uh -huh. How do we instill the spirit that you're discussing 
in our young people. What would you say to them? I mean, it comes. You know, I, I meet a person out here on the way here. She's been in this country for five months. She's in Bar Barranquilla, Colombia, and she didn't know any English when she came here. And she's already on the road, and and she had, and it was a little difficult for her, a little awkward for her, but she sort of plowed through, and she handled herself very, very well in my estimation. But you have to sort of plow through. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need to be scared about some things. I, I don't like to give speeches unless I'm nervous. Because every time I've thought, I got this locked, I've got this knocked. Um, I don't connect as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so Henry Ford the first, who was not a good human being, he had a lot of crap in his soul. If you read the history of Henry Ford, might have been brilliant in one way, but he had bad stuff in his soul. But he once said, "If you think you can do a thing, or think you cannot do a thing, you can." Yeah, which I is. If you think you're a serf, you're going to be a serf. If you think you have some, I'd never use this word, but if you think you have some personal agency, you do. Uh, and those are the great stories of the world. People who decided, I can make something, make something happen. My favorite president is Abraham Lincoln. We've had, what, 46 presidents or so. Abraham Lincoln was number 16. He was only 56. I'm 25 years older than when Abraham Lincoln was shot to death. But the greatness of Abraham Lincoln was he grew all his life. Here's a person with far less education than anybody around us. Here's a person who had about one year of formal schooling. Um, and, and he ended up being the exact right person at the exact right time in this country because we were about to undergo a war where in a country of 32 million people, 750,000 people would be killed. We needed somebody with a larger vision and the ability to articulate that. We were so blessed to have him. And one of the things that most concerns me now is that people think if I get two, two items from an app, Oh, I know what's going on in this world. Right. And uh, and this republic is not guaranteed. It might have been here since the Constitution in 1787, but it's not guaranteed. And for all the mistakes this country has made, and we have made stunning mistakes uh, in Iran in 53, in Guatemala in 54, in the dirty wars in Argentina and so forth, in the, in the Congo in 1960, we still have wanted to be a good people. We're a very inspirational country and very generous in a bu bunch of ways. If we lose what makes this country so inspirational, and it's not about having more billionaires and bullets than anybody else, if we lose what makes this country special as a beacon for other people, uh, then we've lost what makes this country precious. And and I'm I'm at age eighty one. I'm more worried about this country than I ever have been. Well, you you're also uh, you know we're coming to a close, but I do want to touch upon this with you. You have dedicated a lot of your time, resources, energy into the uh, the Early Learning Coalition. Maybe you could just tell us a little well, bit. Well, I, I, Lawton Childs, who was the governor in the 90s, who I think was a particularly wonderful human being, asked me to chair a statewide task force on early childhood, early learning, the crucial early years. Though we have raised five children and to be good human beings and to be readers and learners, I never understood the power of that, I, and I so understood the power of that that I decided to retire and work full time on the subject, thinking the future of America depended on 
more children being ready to succeed in school and life. So, for instance, I went to high school in Bradenton, Florida, on the other coast, and then went to college at the, uh, at the University of Florida. When I went to high school, we were number one in the country, in the world, in high school education, number one in the world in uh, university. And that is not true anymore, right. which is... A tragedy. And, and tragic, as, as a matter of fact. But I was the kind of child, when I was a senior in high school, I wrote John Fitzgerald Kennedy and Richard Nixon. I sent them an invitation to my high school graduation. So there are two parts of this story. <laughs> Did they show up? <laughs> part, one of the, part one of the story is they didn't show up. Part two is I have in my home. I have an autograph copy from Jack Kennedy of Profiles and Courage. And I have a letter from Richard Nixon saying, I'm sorry, but I can't make it. Uh, I've lived a life where my wife and I have had dinner with Queen, Queen Elizabeth. I interviewed Fidel Castro for five and a half hours. I've sat in a clearing in Bangladesh talking about micro lending. I've interviewed child rape victims in the Eastern Congo. I'm not saving my energy for the next world. So if I put in there golf, tennis, et cetera, then I wouldn't have time for lots of other things, beginning with my own family. I think you say it, in closing, I think you say it very eloquently in the title of your book, yeah. A Dedicated Life. Um, and, and I've enjoyed yeah. reading it. Well, thank you. I, uh, I've sold 22,000. It's still available. Not a nickel goes to me, it all goes to Children's Movement in Florida, but, you know, my goal in life was not to build an estate for our five children. They need to sort of build their own estates. We need to be there to help them when they need help. Um, but I still believe in self-reliance and suck it up and do such a... I also believe that love is terribly important. That people who grow up without love sure. do dangerous things to themselves and potentially to to other people. I need inspiration. I need a role, role model. Uh, and I need to know what's going on in, in this world. And I worry about people checking out, not involved in elections anymore, thinking it doesn't mean anything. I think it means a whole bunch. What was that saying? Uh, for evil to persist, good men just need to do yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, that's basically what it is, and you can see it around the world now. The the tendency toward the autocratic governments. Some of them partially democratic at the same at the same time. Uh, and the world is scarier, I think, than... I'm old enough that I was born during the time of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I've known, I've spent time, literally, with every president from Nixon through Biden. So I've known a, uh, a bunch of people. Uh, I'm worried, I, I won't give you a clue as to who I'm talking about, you'd have to figure out. But we've had a president without a moral core. That scares me deeply uh, because the moral core is at the soul of this country. The great presidents we think of, Washington being a good example, Lincoln being another good example, you know, we're all flawed. Lyndon Johnson was a flawed human being, but he was the best civil rights and education president of the 20th century. I want people to know those things and how the continual history fits together and um, it is a lifelong joy to learn, and and, and so you know I'm not very good on abstract stuff. That just isn't me. I was a failure. I got a passing grade, but I was a failure in geometry in tenth grade. Because I, I, but I still know what a triangle is and a square and a rectangle is, et cetera. And I don't know anything more, as a matter of fact. Uh, but, but I want people to understand that life's relatively short. What kind of example do you set for others? Um, 
well, what's what's the personal example you set for others about being fair, about being just, etc. And as I said before, we're also a country where, in 1882, we have the Chinese Exclusion Act. We're a country that set up an immoral immigration system in 1924. Uh, we're a country that had a resurgence of the Klan in the 1920s. We interned. 110,000 perfectly legal Japanese and, Americans and took everything away from them, too. And, <laughs> and took it away from them, and and somebody could ask logically, why did we do this and why didn't we do it to the Germans or the Italians? Well, there's a pretty fundamental answer. Too damn many of them. Uh, you would have had to imprison, intern statewide, millions state. upon millions of people. But it turned out that. The, the, the preponderance of, of these yeah. folks were in the yeah. toward the west coast, and we could do that. But how do otherwise pretty great people? You know, there's a lot to like about Franklin Roosevelt. There was a lot to like about some people on the Supreme Court. There's a lot to like about the American people. But we accepted all of that, yeah. and we're all flawed. We and, need to learn from it. And I think that's key. We we live. Like you said, well, the life life is not e life is tough. Life is not easy. The world is not easy. Really complicated. Uh, well, and, and complicated and, world, complicated society. And you can't get through this life without pain. Whether it right. is right. we had a son-in-law who choked to death. Mm -hmm. Great tragedy. Right. We've had eight mixed carriages among our children. My wife has Alzheimer's. But on the other hand, my successor as publisher of the Herald, now the head of the Knight Foundation, which is the biggest foundation in this part of the country, his wife died a couple of years ago of ALS. Right. There is such pain in this world, and understanding what is important, right. uh, having a moral core is really important. I, I agree with you. I, I think that of anyone I know, you have certainly demonstrated in your life's work, in your continued giving to those less fortunate, in your, call it a soft spot, in your heart for the young people, the children. But this is a blessing in my own life. It is. Uh, but we, and I have a lifelong habit of saying yes to people. Would you do this? Would you go there? Etc. And. Uh, it is only a partial gift, I promise you. Um, so, I, you know, I wonder frequently, I agree six months ahead of time, I'll do this. And then when it comes up, I really don't want to do it. Uh, <laughs> well, but I've already committed. Well, the good thing you only agreed to do this two months ago. Yeah, no, 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 exactly. You know, Miramar seems next door to me at the time, uh, <laughs> but it turned out to be an hour and a half. Uh -oh. so I but I'm, I'm just fine, and I'm blessed in a whole bunch of ways. Well, we're blessed, too, and we, we really appreciate you. Well, I'm glad I came here. I did. It is an honor to count you amongst my friends. It's one of the greatest blessings. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us. So this is uh, Professor Ken. And this is Professor Paul Marino. And thank you for joining us here on the Forward Motion Business Show. We'll see you out there real soon.